Wow. We were at Bryant Denny Stadium last night, Texas 34, Alabama 24. I followed Alabama on the road for a long time. They were at home last night, but I have been blessed enough to cover this sport, and I followed Alabama into some big games, and I've watched them go on the road. I've watched Alabama go on the road for years and make it a hallmark of theirs to get up on a team, to kill their spirits, to suck the will out of their bodies, and to start draining a stadium, start just just emptying sections of stadium long before the clock hits zeros in the fourth quarter. And the reason I mention that is because for the first time in my life, I watched someone do it to Alabama last night. Texas came in there, and they didn't run away with it, but they controlled a vast majority of the game. When they didn't control it, they hit Bama right across the jaw. As soon as they dropped the lead, they regained the lead, and then they stretched the lead, and then they held on to the lead, and that's football. That's how you win a game. So a ton of credit is about to be given to Steve Sarkeesian. I'm going to talk about Alabama in a second. But you got to understand how surreal it is to be in an environment like that, period. Then you got to understand how how much more surreal it is, having known Alabama as we've known them for a long time, to watch a team come into their building and then look up in those stands and look at those aisleways and it looks like little crimson ants just headed towards tunnels all over the place. Texas did that. Never seen anyone do it to Alabama before. Texas did that. Here's what America learned last night. America learned a lesson we've been trying to teach dutifully on this show. I will continue the efforts. Whether it's in vain or not, I don't know. But do do you at least somewhat believe me now that there is a difference between what a man and what a team cannot do and what they have not done? No one's telling me anymore about what Steve Sarkeesian can't do. No one's telling me about what Texas can't do or what they can't be because He is, and they probably are. It was always cannot. It was a matter of time. As it turned out, there was never a barrier. There was never a stop sign in front of Texas winning big games or being back or Steve Sarkeesian winning the big one. It was always a roadblock. It was always a hurdle. And then last night they did it. And so now what? Now maybe they make this their own calling card. Maybe Texas wins a national title this year. That's not a prediction. My point is that's the next chapter in this whole cannot versus have not debate. Well, now they won a big game. Well, well, they can't win a national championship. Well, they haven't uh, in this era. They haven't. It's not that they can't. Texas can win it this year if everything falls for them, if they execute. But I'll tell you, when I was standing on the field last night, man, I was thinking back to our fall camp intel series when we were talking about Texas practice and we were getting so much good feedback about that defensive line, about that defensive front. And I thought this was the matchup of the game. And it was the matchup of the game last night. I mean, Texas, I thought, uh, was going to be a very, very stout run-stopping unit, and they are. And we had been getting reports of that, and that's why I kept on telling you, hey, I think the difference with Texas this year may be not only do they have firepower, but if it doesn't click, or in other words, maybe they're in a log jam, maybe they got 13 points on the board in the third quarter, Maybe defense can help them win games. Maybe defense can win games, or at the very least, maybe defense can give them time until that offense clicks and wins a game. Yeah, that kind of happened last night. Now, that's not, stars, that's not Steve Sarkeesian's calling card, is it? No, it's not. But that's a very well-coached team. It's not a side of the ball. It's not what USC was last year, in other words. And USC may be evolving in their own right there, but there's, there's kind of a difference now. That's a good team. It's not a good side of the ball. Padlock stat. Oh, hold on a second. Hold on a second. There we go. Padlock stat from this one uh, was 3.1 yards per carry. If you tell me Alabama's only putting up 3.1, if you tell me Bama's putting up 3.9 yards per carry, I'm telling you outside of turnover misfortune for Texas, they're winning the game outright. That was it. It was, it was Bama's run game or lack thereof, even when you mix in quarterback run which I thought we'd see more of. Uh, even when you mix that in, just really, really underwhelming on the ground, but it's not like they're running against air and tripping up. Texas has got everything to do with that. Also, uh, Bama, 10 points off turnovers. You start to throw in those other things, those things you can't predict. But if you even just take that and put it in its own little isolated chamber over here, if you just tell me Bama's not going to win that individual matchup. Uh, Bama's offensive line got handled last night. I know a lot of you want me to talk about that as well, and I will in a second. But we talk about winners first on the show. Texas is the winner here. Steve Sarkeesian's the real deal. Now, I know that some people already believed in him. I know a lot more people got converted to that way of thinking last night. Steve Sarkeesian's been the real deal. 
Okay, he's been the real deal. Just because he didn't win big games immediately, just because they had a bunch of games not go their way in the fourth quarter his first two years, it's not like he's any different a coach now, guys. It's just that he has built an organization instead of just building a team. Sometimes we got a guy in, in a ton of controversy right now at Michigan State who a couple of years ago, Mel Tucker, put together a great team. They didn't put together a great organization, and that's why it crumbled the very next year. Steve Sarkeesian's built an organization. He's built a program at Texas. And so recruiting's there. Talent acquisition on, on all sides of the fence is there. But he's got a tremendous aptitude for the game. If you're ever around him, if you ever listen to him talk, you know there are layers to him. It's, it's not just surface-based. Like, you understand there's psychology behind it. Like, it's a little more cerebral. Also, I think he's built a winning organization, both sides of the ball, offense and defense. And also, he understood because he, he worked for the best. He just played him and beat him last night. He worked for the best and learned what organizational structure at an elite program is supposed to look like. Out of curiosity, sometimes if coaches will do it for me, I'll ask them, can you show me, can you show me an organizational chart? Those things are so big, immunity. Those things are so big in major programs. And uh, some of them won't do it, and I understand why, but the ones who are nice enough to do it, it stands out so much uh, what, what a Tier 4, Tier 3, Tier 2, and Tier 1 program can afford in terms of organizational flow. Well, Texas is Tier 1. And so they got an army out there. But even them, it doesn't matter. Like Florida's got a ton of folks on their staff. How discombobulated did they look in week one? Texas last night looked like the home team. They made Bama look like the road team. Bama was the one with the ton of penalties. Bama was the one uh, stepping on their own foot. It was Texas that looked ultra tight, well put together. It was Bama that looked wobbly. That's the sign of a well-coached team. Texas is well-coached. And it's a well-run organization. Uh, I'm just saying that, I know it sounds commonsensical, I'm just saying that because everyone who has said the opposite is going to be quiet today, but they don't go anywhere. If Texas goes and loses a random conference game in two weeks, they'll be right back. And again, Sark will be no different a head coach. They've got Wyoming this week. They go to Baylor in two weeks. Uh, that Oklahoma game looms on October 7th. Texas is a player here. They held the ball the final seven minutes of the game last night. Who does that sound like? Who used to do that a lot? Who used to live in opposing teams' backfields? Who forced the other team out of their game plan week after week? Who looked like the better coach team by a wide margin? That used to be Alabama. Texas out Bama Bama last night in their own building, no less. It's a really big deal. It's, a, it's, it's one game. It's an out-of-conference game. But some of these games mean more uh, because the lasting effect impacts the future. And anyone who says otherwise in college football is kidding themselves. So Texas is not going anywhere. And when I say that, I mean they're not going away. You're going to have to deal with them for a long time. Also, I would be remiss if I didn't remind you when Sark and his, his staff got there – there was that misnomer that, well, Sark's inheriting a pretty loaded roster because Texas is recruited well. They've got good players. Uh, they, didn't have, they didn't have nearly good enough players, and they weren't nearly well enough developed, and the talent wasn't evenly distributed across the roster. There were glaring holes, line of scrimmage, not the least of which. They physically went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Alabama last night. Uh, you could say they were the physically superior team to Alabama. Now, you want to tell someone that two years ago, and say, hey, two years from now, you will go into Bryant-Denny Stadium and you will look like the physically superior team. And it won't be because Bama's physically dropped off. It will be, and this is very important, it'll be because you've elevated to meet that standard instead of Bama falling down to where you're just currently hanging out. That strength and conditioning staff, player personnel, everybody, top to bottom, all the way down to player evals out of high school, that stuff matters, and they got the right people in the building there. So... What happened to Alabama? First thing that happened to Alabama is they played a really good team last night. I think this is one of those classic checkback games. And, and a month and a half down the road, if Bama hadn't lost again and Texas is rolling, you all of a sudden say, huh, you know, I thought ill of Bama at the time. But close game, 10-point game against a really good Texas team, maybe that wasn't the end of the world early in the season. Or, or Bama could have two more losses by November. And all of a sudden you're saying, 
well, maybe that win over Alabama isn't really as impressive for Texas as we thought it was. It's a checkback game. But what happened to Alabama? Ten penalties for 90 yards happened to Alabama. Minus two in the turnover column happened to Alabama. Ten points off of those turnovers happened to Alabama. And basically what I'm telling you is a lot of the stuff that plagued them last year happened to Alabama. I think that's probably uh, one of the toughest pills to swallow for Nick Saban's coaching staff is I strongly believe they thought they had that stuff cleaned up, as they say, which is a phrase I'm going to address tonight. Kind of tired of it a little bit. Uh, not just with Bama, I mean in general. Uh, A&M, tired of it with A&M too. So uh, Bama's offensive line was a crushing disappointment last night. Now, uh, anyone who's watched this show knows I was fully bought in to this offensive line being one of the premier offensive lines in college football. Now, I still think in time that they, they've got the ability to be a very, very good unit. Certainly nowhere near what I thought they'd be to this point in the season. So, and that's, that's also... You know, when you start looking at what they should be versus what they were last night, what they should be is blowing folks off the ball, winning first down consistently, being able to move the ball on the ground when you can't do that. And I'm already sitting here telling you in fall camp, hey, pass pro will be what it is, but their run blocking is what's going to be the difference. And it's second and nine, it's third and seven all the time, totally out of their comfort zone. That's when having a true freshman at left tackle is really going to bite you. But also at quarterback, I was one of the folks who was really surprised Nick Saban didn't make a move last night. And it's never easy to do that stuff, I know. It's, it's down to down, it's series to series, but standing on the field sometimes, it is wild how vividly you can tell a quarterback is locking on to a guy, how, how vividly a quarterback is kind of zoned in over here, and how defensive backs can see that because you're on the field. Like I'm standing behind Texas' secondary. I'm watching Jalen Milrow, and what, for what feels like an eternity at football speed, he's just locked on to either a zone of the field or an individual receiver. And I'm not saying it's easy to pick those balls off, but by high-level college football standards, some of that stuff was easy for Texas' secondary last night. And um, it doesn't have to be easy for that unit because they're pretty good. I was surprised. I was very surprised. When we're sitting here talking about quarterback competition back and forth, and we got Ty Simpson, we got Tyler Buckner involved in that thing, and uh, you don't see even a series for those guys. I didn't think that they were put in the best position to win last night in the second half. Competitive game, I get all that, uh, but no, I, I didn't feel that way. So Nick Saban knows a whole heck of a lot more about his team than I do. I think the other thing, I was talking with Dennis Dodd on our postgame rap on CBS Sports HQ, the other thing we can't know that Nick Saban can know is it may be even with how poor Jalen Milrow was playing, Nick Saban knows he does not have a better option, which suffice it to say is the leading candidate for the reason he didn't make a move. And if that's the case, it makes it even more glaring how impactful those reports were back in the spring about Bama trying to feel out the transfer portal and who may end up being in the transfer portal. Tyler Van Dyke, is he going to be there? No. He's just going to throw for five touchdowns for Miami yesterday instead. Uh, Sam Hartman, no, he's already, he's already gone to Notre Dame. Devin Leary, no, he's already gone to Kentucky. So, so what is Alabama going to do? They're going to go through spring, and then they're going to bring in Tyler Buckner, and he's not going to start the season, and you got what you got. What's going to happen here? I think we know what's going to happen with Texas. They're going to be a really, really good, solid contending team this year. What will the response be for Nick Saban? They play, it's a weird game this week, by the way. They play at South Florida. They're favored by about 29 or 30. Um, I, I got to tell you, I have no clue where they'll go with the quarterback position. It, listen, there were a lot of things to be taken away that were positive for Alabama yesterday. I, I'm going to hammer this home later. This is not a conference game for them. This seems like a season more so than any in recent memory where even this early, I feel like there's going to be a path for two lost teams to make the playoff later at the end of the year. We're way a long way from that. I'm just saying, I, I know we got some folks um, in, in the Alabama community who want to you know, sell 2023 down the river. There's no way based on what I saw last night. Well, there are teams that end up contending every single year that look like hot, wet trash 
in September. And so 34-24 against Texas, minus two turnovers, nearly 100 yards in penalties, that kind of stuff. I mean, if it's not week to week and, and you tighten things up, maybe there's a quarterback change at Alabama. You know, maybe this is one of those places that you see one of those random out-of-nowhere sparks and all of a sudden they're a hot second-half team. Also, which team on their schedule in the, AC, in the SEC West right now looks insurmountable? You, you watch A&M yesterday? You seen LSU in week one? Like, what, what, who's taking them down? On the other hand, I'll also tell you, there are like five losable games on Alabama's schedule, so it could go any which way. I'm just saying there is a long way to go. What kind of approach do they adjust? Do they feel the need to? That's what we can't know that they'll know in staff meetings. But, man, what a night for Texas. I was, you know what was funny is uh, Friday, I got down to Tuscaloosa Friday because we did some obligations down there. And Texas was staying in Birmingham. So I went over, I drove over to Birmingham and met some of them when they came in. I met with Sark briefly, uh, talked to some of the coaches, talked to some of the players. It, it felt like they were just going to play Oklahoma State. It felt like they were going to play Baylor. Like they were really, really bought in on this whole just another game thing. And everyone says that. But again, we go to the biggest game in the country every week. And a lot of times I'm around those teams before those games. Most of the time, it's not just another game. Most of the time, people have said that to the media. Uh, but guys are doing all sorts of things different. They've added 5% to their routine. There are special trappings for this trip and this opponent. And what in Texas, man? They may have had a bigger traveling party. Like I look over at one point last night, we're on the sideline next to Matthew McConaughey. Yeah, that doesn't normally happen for every Texas road game. But man, they, handed them, they handled themselves like a professional unit last night. And that's why I really... I don't think there'll be any kind of letdown. I don't think anybody will get too high on themselves. I just think they're a championship contending team. And um, it was always there to be had. Let me make that clear, and I'll say it one more time before the end of this show. Nothing about the sport had to change for Texas to be back. Nothing about the structure of this sport was holding Texas back. Only the structure of Texas was holding Texas back. And now Texas got out of its own way, hired the right guy, and everyone's on board, and voila, what do you know? The sport was still tilted to Texas's advantage the whole time, and they just finally caught the marble. Not going anywhere.